Thank you for being here. I'm going to go quickly because there's a lot to cover. I'm going to be talking about design as a signal of human intention. And we have positive intentions. Our intentions are not to make the world worse when we get up in the morning, it's to make it better. This is design. So how do we do that? What does it mean to make the world better every day by design? How can we develop principles, metrics, strategies, and so on? So what I use is cradle to cradle. One thing is waste is another thing is food. We've then expanded that to be a circular economy and its economic piece, which is, has now been accepted by a lot of people. Here we are, circular Glasgow. But when I look at circular, I want to be careful. Because if somebody says I'm circular and therefore I am good, what if you're recirculating a toxic product? It's worse. Circularity is a quantification. It means again. But cradle to cradle is a qualification. It means good. So as we go, I find myself now working also in climate. I wrote the guidelines for a circular carbon economy for the G20 in Riyadh last year. I presented it for both technology and policy. What I look at is a world that is made of two spheres, which we inhabit, generally, which are in our making of things. The biosphere and the technosphere. The biosphere are things that come and go back to nature. These can actually be products of consumption. You can consume toothpaste, bread, so on. But you can't consume a television set. So the fact that we call people consumers is pretty sad because you know, there's 4,360 chemicals, some highly toxic materials in here. And if you said, I'm a consumer, and you want to take it home and encourage your kids to play with it, really? But this is what we call a product of service. We want to watch the television. We don't want to own the chemicals. So the materials are really in the technosphere when they're that way. So things that go back to nature or things that go back to industry or waste equals food. And so when we hear things like zero waste, what does that mean? It really, really means eliminate the concept of waste. That's really important. It's not just an efficiency move. It's actually a design move. Is this important? Last year, almost exactly a year ago, paper in Nature said that all human-made mass now exceeds all living biomass. The weight of human-made things is now greater than every living thing. Oops. So as we go forward, and when we put these two spheres together, we get the regenerative biosphere because it can regenerate natural systems and carbon from the atmosphere. But the technosphere can't. So we need to manage the technosphere. And part of the problem is that we've been powering the whole system by carbon. And carbon is both a material and a fuel. That's the problem. We don't burn aluminium to run the economy. We burn carbon. So what's happening is we're transferring hydrocarbons to the atmosphere from the geosphere at rates that are, as we all well know now, in excess of any optimization we can imagine. So by, doing, by putting it together this way and looking at the carbon, in 2019, we released 42.1 gigatons of carbon. As we look at where we are heading for 2030, which is an interim on the way to 2050, we're going to have to do this. We're going to have to cut our emissions 
well beyond half, probably 60%. And we're going to have to cut, uh, increase our renewable power dramatically and get away from burning. We're going to need to do carbon removal at point sources for any place we do have carbon still burning. By 2050, if we intend to get to net zero, we're probably going to have to capture about 10 gigatons of carbon per year for the rest of this century. This is immense. Nobody knows how we're going to pay for it. Nobody even knows how we're going to do it. But we're going to do it. But it's going to take us all, and it's going to take forever. But that is the point. So what I like about working with Cradle to Cradle is we can work at every scale. Molecules, products, buildings, regions, planet. And the question for me is really quite simple. This is the question for me. How do we love all the children of all species for all time? Start there. So, how do we make the world better through commerce by design? Because I find commerce to be the most powerful engine of change. But it's not necessarily just to become more efficient. That's what happened out of the Earth Summit. We got eco-efficiency. But efficiency is a manager's job. It means to do something the right way. But the executive's job is to do the right thing. Because just imagine you're doing the wrong thing and you're doing it with Six Sigma perfection. You just became perfectly wrong. So as long as we're releasing carbon into the atmosphere at high rates, you know, if you're doing it perfectly, I don't know. We really need to think of something better. So after and during the Earth Summit, I saw these Venn diagrams forming. Everybody saying, okay, we've got a social market economy, so there's social, there's economic, and we're going to add the environment. And if you take these things to extreme, you end up with socialism, you end up with capitalism, and you might end up with an uh, ecologism or Environmentalism. Isms are tricky because they're too extreme. So when I looked at the Venn diagrams, they just seemed so fuzzy. So I thought, what if we make it into a fractal tile, which is self similar at every scale? To the mathematicians, this is known as a Sierpinski gasket, which is a fractal tile at all scales, same at all scales. So we could run around and ask questions about the economy and so on. So what would the economy, economy question be? Pure economy, nothing to do with social, nothing to do with environment. Are you making a profit? Okay, do that. Otherwise you're not here to help us. But then economy social, are people earning a living wage? Social economy, are men and women being paid the same for the same work? Fairness, social social, this has nothing to do with economy, nothing to do with environment. Are people being treated with respect? This is where we see racism, and sexism, and things like that. Then, social and environment, is it fair to expose people to toxic materials in the workplace, or toys for children that are toxic? Then this would be environment first, and then social. Is it fair to leave behind a damaged planet, poison rivers? And then environment, environment, do I follow the laws of nature? I'm an architect. I have no choice to, but to follow the law of gravity. So is it a good idea? It's a law. Well, what other laws does nature have for us? And what if we could follow them while we do our business? Now we're talking, this we call eco-effectiveness. And then we have eco-efficiency. Am I being efficient with all this, to damage as little as possible? But just realize this language is a bit odd because when you get to the circular economy, you realize it's just the economy. It's just the economy. So it's eco-efficiency, typically. If you look at all the circular economy reports, they'll say we're good for the climate because we're using metals again or something. We're being more efficient. Well, they presume we're burning carbon. So financial profit. And then so corporate social responsibility. Corporate social responsibility. Business so social responsibility. It's just the triple bottom line, which is proudly proclaimed. Triple bottom line. It's the bottom line. 
It's what managers do. It's what's left over from the revenue after you manage it. It's managers. This is triple bottom line. But what we want is triple top line. Revenue, growth, creativity, joy, more, not less. More joy, less misery. So really, we want to take on this positive attitude. It is positively defined, it's co-creative, it's still a race diversity, and it's about long-term growth. So I'm turning it into an ESG tool. I use it for the design. I want to use this in the investment world and say, here, you can see your picture. How are you doing? And we can start to score it, and we can start to roll it out. So what are goals? Is a goal of net zero? What does it mean, really? And if I think about <clears throat> what does it mean? That, Negative, net zero, bad, net positive, good, what? net zero. If you, t if you um, talk to a child, and think about talking to children. If I say my goal is nothing, and you're making my life difficult because I have to feed and clothe you, oh, that's a miserable story. And if I say I'm going to reduce my badness by, you know, 20% in three years, what are you doing? You're telling me what you're not going to do. It's like telling the taxi, quick, I'm not going to the airport. It's information, but it's not really that helpful. Why don't we tell people what we are going to do? Because the goal of being less bad is sounds miserable too. Less unsafe, less unhealthy, less unjust, less polluted, economically driven. All right, all right. Less. So there it is. My goal is nothing. <laughs> I'm here to reduce, avoid, minimize. I want to be less bad. So I find it very sad because business people hate charts like this. You ever notice? You're like, well, it goes the other way. So let's do that. Let's have a more good goal. Delightfully diverse, safe, healthy, and just. Clean air, soil, water, and power. Economically, equitably, ecologically, and elegantly enjoyed. Now we're talking. So, let's take the stuff we don't want and put it below the line. Let's take the stuff we do want and put it above the line. And our goal is no longer just zero, which is perfectly fine here, because I'm trying to be zero a bad. Okay, fair enough. But I want to be 100%. Good. Do them both at the same time. So we have an inventory of our choices. Renewable power, coal power, whatever. You have good and bad. Those are human values. That's Plato. Less and more is, is statistical significance. Number, that's Aristotle. So you can't say being less bad is being good because less is a numerical relationship. Bad is a human value. So let's just figure out what we want, good and bad. And then let's just do it. Because if we stick with the stuff in the red zone, we become degenerative in a linear economy. Whereas if we go up to the top and we do that positive, we're regenerative and a circular economy. There you go. So we find this very useful. So cradle to cradle inspired design is designing into these two spheres. We have fundamental principles. Waste equals food. Celebrate diversity. Use clean energy. We've been saying this for a very long time. I wrote the upcycle in uh, 2013 and everything is food. Use clean energy and celebrate diversity. Don't disrespect it. We can respect the disappearing butterflies. But what if we enhance their habitat? Let's celebrate diversity. Recently, Vintage Classics and Penguin decided to make five books to change the way we see the world. And they put Cradle to Cradle next time, The Origin of Species. That was kind of cool. So, what it is, is we're seeing goods and services in the economy, but we're also seeing goods as services. So we design, not for end of life, even though a life cycle assessment is a scientific protocol, the name is a bit odd. Think about talking to the children. Can you imagine going home and say, today I spent my day designing for the end of life. Really? <laughs> What's that mean? So we don't do that. Why would I do that? We design for end of use. Because that begs the question, well then, what would the next use be? Oh, now I'm designing for next use. Welcome to the circular economy. See, we don't design for end of life. 
That's a scientific system. And it says you show the source, you show the disposition, and you have to be accurate. Fine. It's very important. But when you're designing, design for end of use. So the five elements we use in our certification programs are these the five good materials, good economy, good uh, energy, good water, and good lives. The standard is thick, it's heavy, it's a lot of science. It will put you to sleep. So any insomniacs here, go for it. It's thick and it's full of long words. But what it's, what it's led us to is the ability to certify in a dignified way for product quality. And one of the most exciting ones, uh, examples of those is in this room. And Stuart will introduce it to you. This, this standard is a voluntary standard. But uh, it's been accepted by Walmart, Walgreens, uh, in the United States, the building uh, protocols. Very exciting. Governments, too. Brussels, uh, San Francisco. And then amazingly, last year, Jeff Bezos and I issued a press release. They had looked at 8,900 certifications around the world to find the best products for their customers and determined using AI and whatnot that Cradle to Cradle is number one. Isn't that great? So onward, everybody. Let's do it. So when you look at the Cradle to Cradle circular economy, you realize it goes from linear to circular. We don't have take, make, waste. We have retake, remake, restore, regenerate. There's a lot of re's, as you'll notice, Stuart and I are forming a company called Re. It's here. Um, I first introduced this in public in uh, the 90s in China. This is Deng Xiaoping's daughter. And the paper I'm holding in my hand is called Cradle to Cradle, the Circular Economy and the Search for Ecological Civilization. So, so here's the history of the circular economy according to Amy Nemo. We brought it to the, uh, to the um, World Economic Forum in the mid uh, teens, and I was chair of the circular economy for Davos. Um, and it's a search for the good. A search for the good. The five goods. Good materials. This is a um, space station. NASA asked me to work on the Mars space station. And I said, I can't go to the red planet until you go to the, back to the blue one. So can we build a space station on Earth, please? So we did. And I worked with the rocket scientists. We made a building that can produce 40% more power than it requires to operate. Purifies its own water. It was done with a normal federal budget ahead of schedule. It's the highest performing building in the federal government. They say you don't need to be a rocket scientist to do something smart. But what if you were? Why don't we get a rocket scientist to design buildings? What fun. So here's a building that all the materials are designed to go back to the industries from whence they came or to be used in other projects. They're certified all the way. And then in, in Amsterdam, we did a whole project complex where we constantly increased the number of cradle cradle certified products in the first cradle to cradle certified um, circular economy developments. I designed Herman Miller's factory. And afterwards, they said, what else do you want to do? I said, I want to do furniture. They said, we don't hire architects to design furniture. I said, no, no, I don't want to do a chair. I want to do all your furniture. So, Herman Miller's furniture is all done this way now. It's exciting. With CNA, 28 euros, certified gold jeans, we now platinum. Organic cotton, perfect dyes, wardens, made with renewable power. The water coming out of the factories is clean enough to drink. People are treated fairly. We've now taken on L'Oreal. We're doing hundreds and hundreds of SKUs for L'Oreal, the world's largest personal care company. And, um, and good economy would be circular sharing and share. Not just sharing economy, but shared economy. Not with few people, long money, and not just Airbnb and Uber sharing things, but shared. We'll get to that at the end. But here's a car that we did first. Back to, uh, it can go back to the company. You're storing the raw materials on the customer's floors. 
Same with Philip. They saw the light now. They keep ownership of the fixtures. Of course they do. Indium, gallium, aluminium. These are their materials. Why would they send them to your kitchen to never even get properly depreciated? And why would they design for planned obsolescence? What's the point? So it's a whole new model. So whole developments like this, we've designed all this. Then for Davos, I did a little circular economy building in honor of Stan Stahlmacher, who is right there. And this is the first ice house in Davos, made of aluminum, and then polymer sheets with nanotechnology insulation. We call ice for fun, innovation for circular economy. And it's a cold place. So anyway, we use it as a meeting room. And it goes up in a day and a half. And it goes back and can go anywhere else. It's made from only two pieces, a metal, an angle, and a straight. It's as if, look, Mr. Fuller woke up, you know, went to bed dreaming of domes, but woke up with the right angle. So um, this is a new university in Bogota, Colombia, dedicated to small and medium-sized enterprises going circular and cradle to cradle. We have 18,000 students. It opened a few weeks ago. The building breathes. All the air, beautiful temperature there, goes through these louvers above the windows and out the back in these thermal chimneys, silent, breathing, fresh air everywhere. Imagine. Fun to look through to. They're like leaves on a tree. A building like a tree. So good energy is clean and renewable. This is an article I wrote for Nature. And you know, people look at that picture, oh no, poor Beijing, you know, that was a fog in Vancouver. So change our language, living carbon, durable carbon, fugitive carbon. Carbon's not bad. We are carbon. We are carbon. If you don't like carbon, shoot yourself, dry up and blow away, because you're carbon. So why would we demonize carbon and tell the kids it's bad? No. Living carbon, durable carbon, yes. Fugitive carbon, no. It's a toxin. So here's a building that powers itself, feeds itself. This is YouTube's headquarters. Just finish that. It's, this is it, a solar and, and ancient meadows. A city in China concept. 100,000 people, 120 um, square kilometers. Cities can do this, Glasgow. Cities can do this. Glasgow. Let's go to Glasgow. Same diagram, whole city, lots of fun. Let's go do it. So here's the G20. That was accepted by all 20 leaders. We all have to do it together. It means that everything we do has to feed the, the beauty of the whole system. This uh, green roof, largest green roof in the world, Save for $35 million in CapEx over conventional water treatment. That's like giving them an order for $900 million for their cars at a 4% margin. Why? Because they put on a green roof. Wow. So, good lives. Here's a factory in India. It's covered with solar and greenhouses. Why not? We have 1,000 people working inside. We have 450 on the roof growing food for the families. Why not? We can do this. I'll finish with Dr. V. This man was a cataract surgeon. He didn't, he realized he was charging, they were charging $9,500 for an 80 year old to get their eyesight back. He said, why? I've been doing 10 minutes. I need two interocular lenses. Why are they $250 each, et cetera, et cetera. I don't need an operating theater. I need a cubic meter of sterility. So he said, what if I did mass production? I get the lenses down. If I make my own, the companies won't produce the price. All I can say is Dr. V, when he passed away, whatever, five years ago, he had given eyesight to three million people for free. For free. Because if he gave it away for free, he had factories that could make the lenses. So if you could afford it, pay anything, you had to pay what it took to run his seven hospitals. It turned out to be $50 to run seven hospitals. And people who could afford 9,500 would give them 9,500.
Because who do you want doing your surgery? How about somebody who's done it 200,000 times before? So there you go. The five goods of cradle to cradle are pred predicates to all 17 sustainable development goals. So do those for sure. And do these for sure. And the question is no longer how much can I get for how little I give. It's how much can we give for all that we get. Thank you very much.